Hi everyone, welcome to the SIT seminar. Today uh, uh, we will continue with the second them thematic session regarding conformal field theory. And we are very happy to welcome Professor Kostas Skenderis from University of Southampton, who has uh, many theoretical research, especially on uh, CFT, ADS CFT correspondence. And today he will uh, give us a talk about conformal field theory in momentum space. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction and also thank you for having me. So uh, I will discuss about a fairly new development about uh, conformal field theory, namely how to develop it in momentum space. Uh, I also want to start by saying you should feel free to stop me at any time the questions. This is better that I get something across sure. rather than I go to my last slide. Um, now, it has been now for a very long time, I would say since the beginning of 70s at least, that uh, conformal invariance imposes very strong constraints. And if you look at it as a, in a quantum system, it imposes a constraints on the quantum observables, which are correlation functions. In particular, it determines two and three point functions of primary operators, which could be scalars, conserve vectors, or energy momentum tensors. I think the first paper that makes this quite explicit is a paper by Polyakov 52 years ago. And then uh, this was kind of systematized over the, the intervening you know, 20, 25 years. And then in this paper, they discuss quite explicitly expressions for three point functions. So, for example, the expression for the scalar of three point function takes the form indicated over here. So, I have three operators, each have a scaling dimension. Delta, the first one delta one, the second delta two, and the third delta three. And given the scaling dimensions and the positions of the insertions, this is the form of the correlator. And it also determines the form of higher point functions up to functions of cross ratios. And I will make this a little bit more explicit later on. But this results and many, many others have been obtained in position space. And that's in stark contrast with general quantum field theory, which usually we, when we compute Feynman diagrams, when we do perturbation theory, these are typically computed in momentum space. So while the results that people obtain have been very powerful, typically these results only hold at separated points. So if you look at this expression, this holds strictly speaking when x1 is different than x2, and x3 is different than x1 and x2. But correlators generically in quantum field theory develop short distance singularities when you take the points close to each other. And dealing with those is what renormalization is all about. So ideally, one would like to know the results not just at separated points, but at all points. And furthermore, this, this uh, position space techniques are very hard to. Uh, extend away from the conformal point. So ideally, we would like to have techniques that allow us to describe more general kind of field theories. Now, momentum space results are also ne needed in, in several recent applications. And actually, that's how I got into this topic. Uh, about 10, 15 years ago, I started working in uh, a holographic framework for cosmology. And then uh, in that framework, I needed to know the results of conformal correlators in momentum space. And we quickly found that uh, this was not available. So then uh, after a few years, we ended up developing the methodology I will describe ourselves. Um, and they're also used in, uh, for instance, in studies of three-dimensional critical phenomena and many other works. So this is a topic which is a kind of emerging, more and more applications are coming. So what I will do today is I will start by describing <clears throat> the what is the, the for, what are the constraints due to conformal invariance? These are encoded in the so-called conformal world identities. Then I will describe the solution of uh, this world identities. Uh, and then we're gonna move on to discuss uh, kind of more subtle issues which are related to renormalization 
the existence of uh, so-called beta functions and anomalies, and we're going to do this just correlator by correlator. We'll first discuss two-point function. This was more or less, I would say, known before I entered into this field, but that allows to kind of explain the issues in the, in the easiest possible setup. Then we'll discuss uh, the scale of three-point functions, which is the first thing we did. That's, I think, is almost completely solved now. And then we're going to move on to discuss high-point functions, and I will focus mostly on so-called holographic four-point functions, namely four-point functions of a CFT, which are obtained using the ADA CFT correspondence. And then I will finish off the discussion by, discuss by discussing the cases where uh, <clears throat> the operators involved are tensorial, they're not scalar operators. So this discussion here, they're going to restrict to scalar operators. But for uh, certainly for two and three point functions, we completely understand also the issues for tensorial and for uh, high point functions. This is probably the issue which is mostly unknown. Now, what I will discuss today is it gives an overview of work done over uh, the last uh, nine, 10 years. So uh, I think if it started in, in 2013, where we set up the framework, the, the general framework I will discuss uh, today. And then we apply that framework in, in a sequence of papers. We want to zoom in to discuss uh, uh, special issues in special cases. So in this paper, we discuss the normalization of scale of three point functions in the in this one then we discuss uh, normalization when you have stress and tensors and conserved currents and the following one we combine all ingredients and every time you put a new ingredient there are new issues that arise um, so it's not a kind of a trivial incremental change when you go from one to the next to the next um, then we have a separate paper where we discuss how to evaluate the integrals that, that they appear when you try to compute these correlators. And then in more recent times, we return back to the general case. So in these two papers, we determine the form, the general form of endpoint functions of scalar operators. In this one, then we, we zoom in to discuss uh, holographic ones, kind of four point function. This relates also a little bit to the application uh, I discussed early on to uh, holographic cosmology. This type of results are also useful in that context. And in the work that uh, I'm currently finishing, we're also starting going outside uh, the, uh, the space of conserved of operators. So we're going to discuss non-conserved tensorial operators. And of course, uh, my own work is not the only work in that field that has been a series of papers by other people. Uh, there is a group in Italy by Coriano and his students, uh, Maldacena and Pimendal in and, and the, and the US also wrote an important paper and, and, and many others. But most of what I will describe today will be based on uh, the, the, uh, the discussion in these papers. Okay, so I will start from the beginning. So uh, setting up what, what is the problem we want to solve. So first, what are what is conformal invariance? So conformal transformations consist of standard Poincaré transformations. In addition, we have two other uh, transformations. One is dilatations, and the second is a so-called spatial conformal transformations. Dilatations are very easy to describe; you just amount to rescaling your coordinates. And uh, because of this, I mean, this transformation is a linear transformation and its implication is very easy to work out. What is difficult is to impose the implications of spatial conformal transformations because these are nonlinear. So at, at the infinitesimal level, they're given by an expression of this form where B is a constant vector. And because these are nonlinear, this makes their analysis very complicated but also makes the, 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 the results a lot more powerful. So once you manage to crack the problem and understand how to impose these constraints, you kind of uh, learn a lot of things about the correlators. It is really the spatial conformal transformations that impose these strong restrictions that I, I described at the very beginning. Now, the corresponding work I've done at this, which I will... Uh, uh, I will show you in the next few slides, are partial differential equations. 
nonlinear partial differential equations, and that's why they're very hard to solve. So then one can ask, how did people like Polyakov manage to obtain the results they obtained already 50 years ago? And uh, the way they've done it was not by solving directly this partial differential equations, which again, I will display in the next few slides, but uh, by using a property of conformal transformations, the property of the spatial conformal transformations, this can be viewed as a combination of inversions with translations. So what people analyze was analyze the restrictions of it, that or the implications of inversions. Uh, you know, something happened here. Can you still see my... Yes, okay. Yes, uh, we can. Yeah. <clears throat> so we'll see that uh, in momentum space, we'll be able to solve directly the uh, spatial local form of worth identities. So it's still an interesting question to try to map the problem that people solve in position space, how to use the kind of the implications of inversion translate into something in momentum space. Uh, but it's, 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 not, uh, it's, it's, not, it's not a trivial way to translate from position to momentum space. So here we'll actually see that we can directly solve the equations. Okay, so what are the equations we're solving? So we have operators that have definite transformation properties under conformal transformations. So this means that if you do, if you change the point to the transformed one, then the correlator should transform tensorially, should transform, should you get back the same correlator with a factor which is the Jacobian of the transformation uh, to the power raised depending on the conformal dimension. So this is the this is in a sense the defining equation that one wants to solve. Now you can start from here and then write this in an infinitesimal form. And then infinitesimal form, the uh, this yield differential equations for the correlators. So for dilatations, this is a very simple equation that one gets, one gets the equation over here. So this means that the correlator is a homogeneous function of the positions of a certain weight. And the weight is just given by the sum of all the, the, the weights of uh, the, 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 the weights of each of the operator. Now, if you go to momentum space, you get a similarly simple equation. And the reason is, since this is a linear transformation, it results also uh, into a, a simple equation. So it's again, the momentum space expression is again uh, a homogeneous function of momenta of a slightly different degree. And the fact that it's the, the degree is different is related to the fact that I have factor out a momentum preserving delta function. So when you work in momentum space, translation invariance implies that uh, the sum of all momenta should be equal to zero. So strictly speaking, I should have had here also a delta P1, P2 plus Pn. And it's this factor that changed the, the weight here. So sometimes I will include those, sometimes not. Hopefully it would be clear from context. But in the paper, it's very clear when the delta functions are included and when not. Um, now, when you go to special conformal transformations, then uh, the question that one gets is, uh, in position space is this one over here. And then you can see this is uh, a nonlinear first order partial differential equation. If you go to momentum space, it continues to be nonlinear. Now it becomes second order. So you would think that's the one into the wrong direction. You, you, you went from a first order equations to second order equations, but it turns out this equation is easier to solve directly as a PDE than this one. Okay, so these are the equations. So now in the next few slides, I will describe the solutions. Uh, I will not describe how we solve the equations. That that would be uh, one or two more lectures to give all the uh, kind of the, the technicalities. But I'll give you a sense of what is the solution. So the first uh, is the sorry, professor. Uh, yes, I have a question. Probably it's uh, it's trivial, but uh, I I didn't follow the the equation. The left hand, what why it's equal to zero? Uh, where does zero come from? 
uh, how you mean this uh, this one here so here yeah. yes so I write the transformation okay um so delta x means x prime minus x okay uh, so then when I do and then I consider this as being very small so then I linearize on this side and then move the term to the other side and that's how I get to zero and then okay. so the delta acts on you on, on the right hand side okay thank you any other question no from my side it's okay thank you yes. okay hmm. okay so now let's first describe the solution and the well-known solution again this slide here I would say this is well known for at least 40 years or maybe even 50. Uh, so the form of the solution for endpoint function is the following. So I have endpoints and the right hand side. So first of all, we have a Lorentz invariance. So, so we have translation invariance. This means that the right hand side should depend on differences of positions. We have Lorentz invariance, which means this should come out of Lorentz scalar products. So we have the the, the 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 square of this quantity so this gives us xij and then the fact that one has specific scaling behavior accounts to the fact that you need this kind of blue terms so these blue terms take into account the transformation property of the, of the left hand side where this indices here these exponents are related to the conformal dimensions via the formula i give over here so this equation here, if you view this, so when you have a conformal field theory, you say you have a spectrum of operators. So you're given their dimensions. So given the dimensions, you should view this as a linear equation to solve for the A's. So up to three point functions, there is a unique solution of the system of equations. And then you put that up here, and then that's your answer. If you're above three dimensions, the system of equations doesn't have a unique solution, but there is a new arbitrariness that come in. So there's a possibility of having conformal invariance. And these are so-called cross ratios. So you take this axis. So if you have more than four points, and then uh, it's possible to have non-trivial expressions like, like the ones I give over here. So you have, you know, PR, QS, and then on the bottom I have PQ and then RS. And this expression here, one can check is invariant. It's obviously invariant on the scalings, and it's highly more kind of, uh, it's, it's, it's a small exercise to show that it's also invariant under special conformal transformations. So this means that uh, if you add to this expression here any function of this cross ratios, that will have all the right transformation properties and solves all the conformal word identities. So that's the solution of the conformal word identities in position space. Now, in momentum space, the same expression was only worked out three years ago in this paper. And uh, this is the solution. Now, the solution is now described by providing a simplex. So here we have the input is again the end positions of the operators. Now we're in, 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 in momentum space. So you can think of uh, an n dimensional space where you have n vectors, which are the momenta. So then what you do is you just join each vertex with every other one. So this is called a simplex. So here, if I have the vertex P1, I draw a line from P1 to P2, P1 to P3, P4, all the way to Pn and so on. So each vertex is linked by a line to every other vertex. This is by definition, this is the mathematical definition of what the simplex is. And now for each line that joins two vertices, we introduce a momentum, which uh, we label by which, which vertices join. So Q12 is, the, is an internal momentum that joins the vertex one, with a vertex two, two to three joins the vertex two with the vertex three, and so on. You put all of them. You, you introduce all such possible momenta. So then, what you do is you integrate over all such momenta you can have in internal sites, and uh, 
at each vertex, you have momentum conservation. So if you sum up all the momenta that come to this vertex, you get zero. So this is this, uh, this factor here. And then you need to multiply this with a function that contains kind of momenta that goes to the vertices, this function here. So this is the analog of this blue factor over here. And then in the numerator, you multiply with a function of a new cross ratios, momentum space cross ratios, which look similar to those, but actually they're very different. This, the, the one over here is not the Fourier transform of the one over there. So here you just have momenta. So it's a ratios of different momenta. And uh, one can show that this, okay, there is a long proof. Again, if we had um, another hour, we, we, we would have gone through the, uh, the, the steps of how we proved it. So we can prove that the, the Kofama word identities I showed you earlier are uh, solved. This, this is a general solution of this, of this equation. So conformal invariance does not impose any further constraints. So any f hat of u hat is, is, is allowed. So this is a general solution. So now we understand how to, what are the conformal worth identities and how to solve them both in position and in momentum space. So what we're gonna do next is we're gonna go through the cases one by one and understand uh, the, 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 in which cases one is renormalization and how to do it and what this implies. Questions? Let me say why we need renormalization. See, we have an integral. So this integral may not converge. This is a formal expression because, for instance, if the momenta become very large, this integral may not converge. So you need to understand how to make sense of this formal expression. And that's how, th these are the short distance singularities. Short distance singularities in momentum space are places where the kind of high energy limit. In position space, this would be the cases where uh, the x's go on top of each other. Okay, so <clears throat> let's start doing it with the scalar two point function, which is the simplest case. And this would also allow us to kind of uh, understand a little bit more this solution over here. So if we have a two-point function, so here I told you that the solution is described by a simplex. So we have two, two momenta, P1 and P2. So this means that in this case, the simplex, just a line. So here we have P1, P2, and then I need an internal momentum, Q1, 2. And then uh, I need to solve the, the, the uh, coefficients here or the solutions of that equation. Um, but this question, okay, this alphas here are under symmetric in, in its indices. So there's only alpha one, two. And you can see I have two equations, delta one for delta two, and both of them are forced to be equal to each other. So for the two-point function, to be non-vanishing, the dimensions of the two operators have to be the same. And now, uh, if I now put the, the so now I have okay, here I have k one to n, so n equal to two in this case. So I have two delta functions, and one will be p one plus q one two, and the second one will be p two minus q two one. So I have two delta functions. We can use one to do the integral. And then the other one just gives the momentum preserving delta function. So now we see explicitly what is the solution for the two point function. So now let me now if ignore that factor, which is always there. And then the general solution for the two point function is the one I indicate over here. So it's the momentum to a power multiplied by constant. Okay, that's the general solution. But now the special cases. And the first, the, the, in this case, the, the special case is when the dimension of the operator is the one I indicate over here. It's d over two, where d is the space time dimension plus an integer. When that happens, this factor here becomes p to the two k, where k is an integer. And if I Fourier transform back to position space, this is a box 
to, to a power times a delta function. So this correlator here is localized on a single point. So it's a conductor. So this means you can trivialize, remove that correlator by renormalization. And that's why the, this correlator on its own is trivial. So when it's a more general solution. So the other thing that happens when uh, the dimension is of that type is that one finds that there is a new local term one can write down that, that has scaling dimension, which is equal to the space-time dimension. So when we have operators, we can couple them to sources. And then the dimension of the source is D minus delta. So in this case would be um, D over two minus K. And then this means that this combination here has a scaling dimension D. So this is gonna play an important role in the next couple of slides. Okay, so, but in position space, we're uh, kind of used to the fact that two point functions, they, they take this form, have one over X, to the two delta, where delta is a space-time dimension. And one usually doesn't discuss special cases. So what is what, what was special with this dimension? Now, the point is that uh, correlators should be viewed as, uh, as operator value distributions. And uh, this means that for this expression to make sense, it has to be a well-defined distribution. In particular, it should have a well-defined Fourier transform. So if you try to forget transform this, there is a well-known formula, which I give over here, but this formula contains a gamma function. So when the dimension takes the values I described earlier, then the gamma function diverges. And this expression here is not, does, does not define a forget transform. So this expression here is well-defined everywhere, except when this happens. So when this happens, one needs to renormalize the expression. Now for two-point functions, it is known how to renormalize in position space, but for high-point functions, it is not known. So what I will describe in the next few slides, I will do it directly in momentum space because that generalizes to high-point functions. Okay, so now one every time one has an issue with infinities in quantum field theory, the first thing you need to do is you need to uh, regularize the theory, make try to make a sense of a theory where the infinities are more under control and then understand how to remove them. So the first step is always regularization. And uh, the regularization we used in this paper is to continue the parameters to, uh, that we have in our disposal. So the theory, the parameters that we have in our disposal is the space-time dimension and the scaling dimensions of the operators, D and the deltas. And then dimensional regularization means that you go away from the integer dimension by some amount specified by epsilon. And then we also continue the dimensions of the operator again by an amount proportional to epsilon. And we allow for uh, different numerical constants of how to do the, the, the um, how, how to regulate the theory. This, this is called scheme dependence. So now, once you regulate the theory, so if I have a general uh, epsilon U, uh, Professor, we we cannot uh, hear you actually. The mic. Just for uh, the last. Uh, okay, it's okay now. Now it's okay. Oh yes. 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 How much did I? From where should I pick it up? Okay, just uh, 10 seconds. 10 Last seconds. 10 seconds. Okay, okay. <laughs> so what I was saying is that uh, for uh, when we regulate the theory by introducing this regulators, the epsilon and the U and the VJ, then you can always arrange. So you, you never, you never at the point where the theory is singular. So you, you never, so the point where the theory is singular is when two delta minus D is equal to zero. So since we're now changing the delta and the d, I can always arrange so that I'm not in the I'm not sitting into zero. So now the regulated theory, this, the general solution that we obtain, is valid. So the general solution 
is was again this one, but now with delta and t continued. So now it becomes this expression over here. But now the constant that appears in front of the correlator in general will depend on the regulator. We depend on epsilon and the parameters u and v that uh, characterize scheme dependence. So now we need to understand uh, what are the singularity structure of these constants. Now, if you have a local quantum field theory, this means infinities can only be local in position space. And that implies that uh, the most general singularity structure one can have is the one I indicate in the second line. So you can have one of that epsilon singularities, but not high order. And uh, now if you now put insert this in and then expand in epsilon, this is the form of the regulated, uh, regulated uh, correlator. One can see there is an infinity, which is local, and there is a non-local piece, which is, it says the, 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 the part of interest. So now once we regulate, the next step is to remove the infinity. And the infinity is removed with a counter term. And the counter term is constructed using the sources that couple to this operator. So, so this the source here. So if I differentiate with respect to the source, I generate insertions, insertions of my operator. And then the counter term is quadratic in the source because I want to remove an infinity from a two-point function, which is related to two derivatives of the action with respect to phi naught. So that's why I have phi square here. And here comes the point I said earlier. So specifically when the dimension takes the special value, that is a specific, that is a specific combination that has dimension D. And that's precisely also the, uh, the counter term, which we need to remove infinity. So now if I adjust this constant here, I can, uh, can adjust so that I cancel that infinity. And then I can uh, remove the regulator, take epsilon to zero. And then this gives rise to a normalized correlator. But in this process, so then the correlator, instead of being this P to the 2K that it was when I started from, which was completely local, now it's multiplied with a log. But the process of doing this has introduced a scale into the problem, this mu square. So this was introduced when I wrote down the expression over here, just on dimensional grounds for this, in, for this to be dimensionless. I need to have an additional scale, and then that scale enters into the correlator. So we started from a theory, which was a conformal field theory, which meant to be independent of a scale. But we found that in the process of defining this two-point function, we necessarily introduce a scale. So if I take the mu d d mu derivative of this correlator, we find it's non-zero. This is called an anomaly because you would expect go from a full theory to be scale independent. But in reality, through the process of removing UV infinities, one has found that actually the correlators do depend on the scale and depend on the scale in a very specific way. So when I take the mu dd mu, I get an expression which is local. And again, if I go back to D dimensions, it's given by this expression. So this is the conformal anomaly, which is related to the uh, scalar operator of this specific dimension. And if you put the theory on a curved background, this expression here would generalize to be the so-called kth power of the conformal Laplacian. So that's this is the simplest instance of what the conformal anomaly is. So you start from a theory which you think classically doesn't have any scale in it, but the process of computing the correlators and understanding the shortest singularities led us to introduce a regulator. Then we introduce counter terms to remove infinities. And then the normalized correlator again does depend on the scale. So there's a formal anomaly. Okay, so now next we're gonna move to generalize that discussion to a three-point function where new issues arise. Any questions on the two-point functions? Uh, actually, I have one question. Uh, anomaly comes from uh, regularization procedure or 
the anomaly comes because it is impossible to maintain, to have a non-trivial operator with specific scaling dimension ha and have uh, a well-defined theory in the ultraviolet. It's a combination. Uh, so you need mm. to, to you need to regularize because you had short distance singularities. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. once you introduce that, it, it may have still be the case that the process did not introduce any 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 new scales to the problem. But it turns out that in this case, it does introduce this new scale into the correlator. And then the correlator, this mu to the mu derivative of the correlator is now non-zero and it's local. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, you will see it again uh, for the three point functions. Maybe it will become, uh, once you see another example, maybe it will become a little clearer. Okay. okay. Okay, so now uh, three point functions. So if we start again from our uh, general solution, so now the uh, with three point functions, again, they're going to be th three points. And then the simplex looks like a triangle. And then you have enough delta functions. You have three delta functions for each vertex. And then uh, you have three, in, three momenta, three internal momenta, and three delta functions. So this means you can, uh, but you also expect to have one momentum conserving delta function. So then you expect the general expression to be one integral of one momentum. And uh, if you uh, just do the exercise starting from uh, the general solution, this one, and put n equals three, then you get. Uh, into this formula here. Now it turns out there is an analog of what has in, in electric circuits, there is this kind of uh, star triangle relations. If you if you try to use Kirchhoff laws to play with electric circuits, we can uh, trade uh, kind of three resistors which are joined in this fashion to become kind of a star. And there is an analog of that for this type of integrals. And if you use that, again, this to describe that fully, it would be uh, on, on a board, it would be in about an hour lecture to put all the details. Um, but the, the final result is that this expression here becomes an integral of three Bessel, Bessel functions. So we, we're gonna, these are gonna be important objects. Gonna, I will call them triple K integrals and I will discuss the properties uh, in a minute. Can you see the entire screen? Actually, do you see the entire screen? Or yes, uh, it's, 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 the last line is uh, where uh, KV is the Bussell function. So yes, we can. Yeah, we maybe can it's see, better now. Uh, yes. Um, yes. Okay. Um, so I will discuss properties of, of this triple case in a minute. Now, uh, so here's a kind of a few additional comments about how this, this solution was obtained. Now, if you're in momentum space, one advantage of momentum space is that if you have uh, a vector quantity like the generator of spatial conformal transformations, then there is a basis to which to expand your expression because the, um, the momenta are linear and independent of one another. So this means Lorentz invariance on its own means that a uh, quantity which is vectorial can be expanded in the uh, in, in, in momenta. And then the coefficients that, the, that multiply each momentum is a linearly independent quantity. So one starts from uh, a complicated vectorial partial differential equation. And in momentum space, not in position space, I mean, that's the advantage of momentum space, you can trade that from n minus one scalar differential equations. So this means that when we are in, for three-point functions, we have two independent equations. And these two independent equations 
turn out to be the ones I give over here. So one defines Kij, which is the difference of Ki's, where Ki is this differential operator. And then the two equations are K12 is equal to zero, and then K23 acting on the correlator is equal to zero. Now, if you stare at these equations, are actually non equations uh, from, from uh, in, in, in special functions. Actually, this system of equations is what defines the so called the Apple F4 generalized hypergeometric function of two variables. Now, this is a useful fact, but actually, this generalized hypergeometric functions are uh, not known well enough for the purposes that we needed. So we had to kind of develop the theory on our own. You can also start from these expressions and just use uh, kind of old good separation of variables method. And if you use separation of variables, this directly leads to the solution that I Oops, described here. So this triple K solution, the easiest way to get into it is to use separation of variables based uh, on trying to solve this partial differential equations. And then it turns out this triple K integrals are the building blocks for all three point functions as it will be clear by the end of the talk. Now this triple K, so for people that uh, are familiar with uh, holography, this should automatically ring a bell because that's the expressions that one ends up when one tries to compute correlators holographically. So holographically, so here I, I, I kind of give a sketch. So you should think ADS with a, with a boundary. So the circle is the boundary of ADS. And then the CFT lives on the boundary of ADS. So the three different insertions are done at three different points at the end of the circle. And then you have vertices in the center, which is come from the action in ADS. And what you do is you integrate bulk to boundary propagators, which in this case, they are related again to this, the same Bessel functions and guess a vertex in the middle. And then one can, uh, with a little bit work, one can show that that tends out to be exactly the same expression. So this expression that we got by solving a form of word identities is also what you get if you would do an ADS-CFT computation. And it's also what you would get if you would do this star, star triangle relation uh, starting from this form of the solution. Okay. Um, Okay, so now let's discuss, since these are important integrals, let's start and discuss a little bit some of the properties. So you can think of this integral as defining a map from position space to, uh, to, to numbers, which are specified by, by four indices. So alpha is the index that multiplies the x, and then beta one, beta beta two, beta three, are the indices of the Bessel functions. Now using properties of the Bessel functions, one can show that this integral here converges, provided alpha is greater than uh, the quantity on the right-hand side. But more generally, one can define the left-hand side by analytic continuation from the regime of convergence provided the indices, the alpha and the betas, satisfy this relation. So if you take this sums and differences, this is different than minus uh, twice, uh, tw twice uh, an integer. So then in, in, in general case, the general expression is given by this triple K integrals, but when equality holds, when one is in this case, one has to analyze these cases separately. So this is the analog of the condition that uh, delta was d over two plus k in the case of the two-point functions. In the case of three-point functions, the analog of this 
is this condition. So when this condition holds, one cannot define the integral by analytic continuation. One needs to do non-trivial subtractions and renormalization. And this gives rise to new conformal anomalies and to beta functions, which I will explain in a minute. And similar to the other case, when this condition holds, one can also show that there are new terms of dimension t, which can either be added to the action to form counterterms, or they can appear in the trace of the energy momentum tensor, and that's kind of the new conformal anomalies. Okay, so there's actually four different cases. Two are important, and two are more an issue with how we represent the correlator. So the first case is when all signs are minus, with the signs here, I mean the signs that appear in this situation. So if I choose minus, 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 and then I transform that to conditions on the deltas. So if the sum of all dimensions is twice the space time dimension plus an even integer, then we have the new conformal anomalies. And in this case, the new counter terms, which are the analog of the counter term we discussed for two point function, it involves three sources because it's a three point function. And the powers uh, that appear in the boxes are related to the integer that appears here. The other cases, the other important cases, when two of the signs are negative and one is positive. And in that case, the counter term that we need is of the type that indicated over here. And this means that the source of that operator is renormalizes. And every time you have a renormalization of a source, this means the theory has a beta function. That's, what, that's why I call this beta functions. And there are two more cases when the signs are either three pluses or one minus and two pluses. And in this case, there are no singularities in the actual correlators. There, it's, the, 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 the singularity is more in the representation of the, um, of the correlator in terms of triple K integrals. And we discussed that in detail also in the paper, and I can explain it more if somebody wants to understand these cases. So I, I think the, the take home message from here is that the, the two main cases where singularities need to be analyzed, one is three minus signs and one is two minus signs and one plus. <clears throat> now, when I have a conformal field theory, or more generally, a quantum field theory, then we can summarize the content of the theory by introducing uh, an effective action that contains all correlators. So if the theory is a conformal field theory, one would expect that the theory doesn't depend on momentum. So you would naively expect that mu d d mu of the generating function of correlators is equal to zero. And the fact that we have short distance singularities has two implications. First, the right-hand side may not be zero, and this is the anomaly. And secondly, the correlator could have an explicit momentum dependence, but that's because the sources themselves, they have an implicit, uh, an implicit scale dependence. And the two facts, so there is an, 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 an explicit dependence and then an implicit dependence, but both of them cancel each other so that the right-hand side is still zero. And all of these cases are realized. So when, when we have, uh, for the three-point functions, we will have three minus signs, it's going to be the right-hand side. When we have two minus and one plus, it's going to be a term of this type. So uh, in, the, in the next couple of slides, I'm just going to illustrate one example of that type. So this type of equations, the equation is, is known as a Kalansi magic equation. So if we start from this equation, which is the generating function of correlators, I can differentiate that with respect to the sources three times and then set the sources to zero to get a relation uh, for the correlator themselves. So from here, okay, so if I differentiate three times, I get a three point function. And this expression here gives me the mu d d mu of that correlator. And then over here, I can either differentiate w, so then I get a two point function, 
or I can differentiate beta and I get these derivatives of delta of, uh, of beta functions, or I can differentiate the anomaly and I get an anomaly piece. So this is the expected form of correlators that are anomalous. And one example of this would be to consider a four-dimensional theory and consider, for example, one operator of dimension four and two operators of dimension three. And pretty much all theories, all conformal field theories that we know contain operators of that type. Uh, for instance, you have, uh, let's say, free scalar. That's a conformal field theory. And then an operator which has dimension four uh, would be you know, phi to the four. An operator has dimension three would be phi, phi cubed. And then you can just use uh, weak contractions to compute the correlator. And you will still find, uh, so that would, what I will discuss here would apply even in that case. So if you have this type of dimensions, if you add them up, you get to 10. And the 10 is uh, 8 plus 2. So this condition is satisfied with k equal to 1. And indeed, if I call phi not the source of the operator of dimension 4 and phi 1 the source of an operator of dimension 3, then this term here has dimension four because that has, uh, yeah, so you can just uh, add them up. And similarly, <clears throat> with the same dimensions, you can also satisfy the plus, the minus minus plus condition. And then that combination here also has dimension D. So we have a possible counter term and we also have a beta function. And if you compute the correlator, okay, that's what you find. You find something which is not local. This depends on the logarithms. And then you, have, you find the pieces that directly related to beta functions and anomalies. So one can see even though one starts by wanting to compute a conformal correlator, the actual answer contains an explicit scale. And if you take the mu to the mu of that expression, that's what you get. So this doesn't depend on the scale, you get zero, and then you only get the other pieces. And these other pieces are precisely what I had over here. So uh, this guy here is this two-point function. I will review later, uh, we will review earlier what is the form of the two-point function, and that's exactly what it appears. And this piece here is the anomaly. Okay, so this was three-point functions. Questions? Okay, so now uh, <clears throat> now going to four point functions. Now we know that the correlator in general would depend on functions of cross ratios. Do, so doing a completely general analysis, I mean, every did, everything we did so far was completely general, was true for any CFT, provided it contained operators of the right dimensions. Uh, but when we go to four point functions, we cannot be as general because uh, Again, the general analysis will have to be done, you know, including general functions of cross ratios. So in this part, we restricted ourselves to uh, holographic correlators. Um, by the way, I can see we are four minutes to four. How much time, how much more time should I get? Uh, Uh, it, it depends on you. If you want, uh, we can extend the 10 minutes more. Or... Okay, so mm -hmm. yeah, let's aim for 10 minutes. So I will uh, briefly summarize these four-point functions. And then I will also briefly summarize the tensorial ones, maybe a few minutes in each, and then we will conclude. Uh, Actually, yeah, so how, how much familiar are you with holographic correlators? Just, uh, I mean, I know we're very few here. But, um... Actually, I'm not familiar. <laughs> not very familiar, yeah. So yeah. That, that, that part, uh, yeah. I think would probably be too hard to get across. Um, 
Yeah, so I think I, I will briefly I will briefly summarize and then move on to, to the to the next. So again, when we compute holographically, this means we will be separate. recorded. So maybe uh, someone later. Or maybe will. someone. Yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, so again, the, the the circle here represents the boundary of ADS, and then at each point we have insertions. So when we move in, each line represents a bulk boundary propagator with a formula I gave earlier. And each vertex is a vertex that comes from a bulk action. And I will show you in a minute uh, a couple of examples of bulk actions. So you can have a diagram of this type, or you can have kind of an exchange type diagram. So where you join, and then you have a bulk to bulk propagator. And in formulas, the bulk to bulk propagator is also related to. Um, uh, to Bessel functions. So it's a product of the I and the K Bessel function. So now the computing the, the, uh, the propagator means that computing the integrals that come by putting together, making, starting from this diagram or in writing the formula. Um, yeah, I think I will skip the discussion of that part. Uh, so here, uh, so usually when you have in quantum field theory, you need to add all diagrams to get a well-defined expression. But it turns out this type of diagrams, the kind of the Witten diagram, so-called Witten diagrams, they have a property that each of them is well-defined on its own, and each of them represents a CFT correlator. And this was in the next few slides. I was I was trying to illustrate this, but we're just going to go through it a little bit quickly. But let me use this slide to illustrate the point with the vertices and the, uh, the, the possible vertices. So here, when we do a, an ADS-CFT computation, we start from a bulk action like this one. It has a kinetic term, has a mass term, and has interactions. So this, this vertex here where four lines meet comes directly from that one. And this vertex is when three lines meet to come from here. And then when you do the computation, so the propagator comes from uh, inverting the kinetic term. And then if the one leg is on the boundary and one in the bulk, is the bulk to boundary. If both legs are in the bulk, are bulk to bulk. So they, they both come from solving the, uh, by inverting the, the, the kinetic operator. Um, and then depending on what vertices you have, you can draw different diagrams. And the reason that each diagram is a well-defined correlator in a CFT is because I can engineer a bulk action such that each diagram, it's, 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 it's the only contribution to a specific correlator. And in, in the next couple of slides, I was just trying to make a point by giving you an, an example how that happens. Okay, but now once you have this, this expressions, the question is, what is the actual value? Uh, can you evaluate those? Now it turns out that one these combinations are half integral. One can explicitly evaluate the, these expressions and obtain final answers in terms of elementary functions. And the reason is that if the Bessel functions where the index is half integral, they reduce the elementary function. So then you can do the integrals. You still need to regularize and normalize because there are infinities. And this is something that uh, it has been overlooked in literature, in the kind of ADS-CFT literature. People have been writing formal expressions like this ones, but they haven't evaluated them exactly, precisely enough to see that there are UV infinities. Uh, but if you regulate it here in this format, one can explicitly check that in many examples that people have tried to evaluate these integrals. And for instance, there have been a series of papers where they looked at the uh, four-dimensional bulk, three-dimensional CFT, and the dimensions of operators for either two or three. Uh, and in this case, is okay, this is a table which contains the, uh, the singularity so this uh, the notation here means which external operators we're considering. So if I look, for instance, this one, I have a dimension, two dimension three operators, 
and two dimension two operators. If the diagram is conduct, conduct means of that form. This is a conduct diagram. And this is exchange. So this is called exchange because it's like you're exchanging something. Well, this is a conduct because all the interaction takes place in a point. And then we're looking at this one. So the conduct diagram diverges as one over epsilon. And if you exchange an operator of dimension three, it, it diverges as one over epsilon squared, so on. So all of these diagrams, they, they, they are divergent and need to be normalized. And uh, when you anomalize, you find that uh, there are new anomalies and new beta functions. And then the conditions for those is similar to the condition I showed you earlier. Now for a uh, four point function is given by that expression where the, uh, the sigmas are the signs or plus or minuses. And uh, in this part, uh, I just went through, let me maybe let's do an example, three, 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 three. So this means that all we're in space time dimension three. So this is that three. And then this deltas are all threes. So this are the rest, this red threes. And I'm looking at the case where I have three minus and one plus. So I have, so the sign here, so it's minus, 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 plus. And then if I add all of these numbers, I get zero, which means I satisfy that condition with n equal to zero and the same for all the other ones. So this means that in, if I have a four point function with four external operators, I have dimension three, then there would be an infinity that requires a counter term, which is of beta function type. And then uh, one can compute the beta function and then one compute the infinities. Yeah, let me skip that part. Uh, there is yet another way to get to the same correlators using uh, so-called uh, uh, weight shifting operators, but let's, let's not discuss this. So in the remaining part, I'm just gonna mention a few more uh, issues associated with tensorial correlators. So when you have the sorry correlators, of course you have some of the same issues, but also have new issues. In particular, you need to understand the general structure of the correlator. And the general structure of the correlator is carried out by momenta and the metric. And you have a very complicated operator. There are many different terms you can write down that has the right transformation properties under the, the Lorentz group. And for a very long time, there has been very little progress in understanding these correlators because it looked very complicated. You had to write too many terms and it was not easy to see how to analyze them. So it's, it, it is very important to find an optimal parametrization in order to be able to solve this problem. And for three-point functions, we managed to do that. So now we have the optimal parametrization that made possible the solution of the problem. Then once you write the problem, then you start from the original conformal word identity, and then you find uh, the equations that the various coefficients satisfy. This split into two parts, the so-called primary conformal word identities and secondary word identities. The first ones determine the correlator in terms of triple K integrals after constants, and the second one constrain the, the values of these constants. So in all cases, the system of equations that one gets has this kind of lower triangular form. So one starts with an equation that looks exactly like the equation for scalar correlators. And then the solution of that becomes an inhomogeneous term in the second equation. And then once you solve that, then that solution would appear in the next one and so on. So you have this kind of... Uh, structure, you have to start from solving this and then move your way down. But it turns out that in all cases, you can always solve these equations using this triple K integral. So that's the building blocks of correlators. Now, once you solve that, then uh, again, you have to go back and say, is my solution valid now in all cases? And uh, for the sorry correlators, the new type of anomalies which are possible. 
So we just, the, the anomalies we discussed so far, they are, they are so-called type B anomalies. They come from counterterms that break conformal invariance. But there is, with the sorry correlators, there is an additional new type, which is called type A. And in this case, is you get because the correlator has a structure of zero divided by zero. So it's zero. It had to be wanted the correlator wanted to be zero because of some conservation law, but also wants to be infinity because it looks like there's going to be infinity. But the ratio is uh, is is is, is non-zero and finite, and that what this is what gives rise to this type A anomalies. Uh, and this momentum space expression allows for a very explicit evaluation of this conformal anomalies. Okay, so I think that takes us to the end. So what uh, I tried to summarize in this talk is how to find the general solution or what is the general solution of performer world analysis in momentum space. And I try to give you some sense of what anomalization beta functional anomalies are. Probably I went a little bit too fast. Um, and especially the last part, we okay. Uh, I wanted to, uh, I was aiming to present also a class of the level holographic four point functions. Uh, uh, what is uh, the, the, the way forward? Uh, Okay, there are new results that we can use for in applications, for instance, in early universe cosmology, like this last part that I went quite quickly. They enter now in the try to analyze uh, holographic models for the very early universe. And uh, the general last piece, which is still missing to understand in complete generality, CFT in momentum space, is to have the general solution on the endpoint functions are tensorial, they're not scalars. We know the general solution when they're scalars, but we don't know the general solutions when ten, what tensors are involved. And more generally, it would be useful to use these tools in uh, using them in this so-called bootstrap program for a CFT that aims to use the, well, there is, an important piece about CFT, which I did not discuss at all, this is called operate, operator product expansion. And I don't think we are already over time. I don't think we have the time to discuss it, but people try to use uh, an addition, this additional input to obtain self-consistency conditions for correlators, which may be used to determine what are the possible anomalous dimensions. So there has been quite a lot of progress in general over the last 10, 15 years. But all of that is done in position space. So it kind of it's, uh, misses all the additional subtle information that comes through uh, the short distance singularities. And uh, that's what this kind of momentum space methods may have something additional to say. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you very much for this talk. Um, is there any question? Okay. I have a, a question, but uh, it's quite general. Um, and uh, because, okay, I, I am doing mathematics and a uh, lot of, uh, I think uh, I like a lot of uh, background to be able to understand much. But uh, at one point, uh, you have mentioned the conformal operator if the space is covered. And mm -hmm. uh, we can replace the box operator with uh, the conformal uh, operator. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the anomalies are, uh, uh, it comes from uh, trying to uh, get rid of uh, infinities in the integration, if I yes. understand. Uh -huh. uh, could we have some interest in theory if uh, we work on a compact, for example, uh, framework or where, uh, for example, the integration is uh, fine? Okay, what's, uh, uh, do we if have-, have, if, you have the, if you put the theory on a finite space, let's say on a sphere, yeah, that's ah. a finite space. That, uh, what that does is removes uh, 
kind of infrared singularities from the problem, but you still have short distance singularities when you kind of try to put the points uh. on top of each other. You still have short distance singularities. It's like, you know, any manifold locally looks like flat space. So similarly, if you put your theory in on a curved manifold and you go to very short distances, it would look like, it would look like the theory in flat space. So all the discussion I had about short distance singularities and the structure, that would always be present locally. And that would ha have important implications about the theory in uh, on curve background as well. I see. Okay. It's not uh, what is not possible is is you know when you have anomalies, anomalies is not an issue about uh, how you choose to treat the theory. That's why they are so subtle. I mean, they do appear when you regularize, but they're really property of the theory rather than a property of the way you choose to compute. Uh, and actually, I I have worked a little bit on, on the because I I think the conformal operator is what also ma mathematicians call Yamabe operator. I don't know if uh, well Yamabe uh, operator. Uh, you so mean if you, if you want to find in a sense uh, a representative uh, of, of, uh, of a pharma class where the the, the 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 integral of the curvature is positive uh, mm. that yeah that's not uh, i mean the, 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 this does does play a role but not uh, mm. it's not a, it's not the same operator that i have been discussing uh, okay um, so it, it, it this this place more like you know it appears more like on, on the right hand side with with the anomalies. Thank you very much for. I don't think I have other question. Thank you so much again. Have a nice uh, afternoon. And actually, okay, it is. Uh, I message. hope it was a little bit useful. <laughs> It was useful, and uh, thank you for coming for this. And also, there is uh, some uh, message from uh, Francisca saying that uh, pro oh, she couldn't uh, join before. I don't know if uh, maybe she misses the time uh, mm -hmm. difference, or but uh, she because uh, she come uh, one hour later. So oh, yeah. she came an hour late. Okay, yeah, yes. so. <laughs> probably can, she uh, confused the time. <laughs> Yes. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, okay, thank you. Very nice. Bye bye. Bye bye.